Uh, sir, I we are going next. Uh, li- okay, sir, we are live. Please start. So welcome to today's session, uh, dear friends. Sorry for the slight delay, uh, connectivity problems, etc. Uh, today's topic is a very basic topic, which uh, should be right to everybody. Uh, the topic is first uh, humidification and then nebulization. So humidification will be taken by Dr. Nikhilesh Jain. Uh, he is uh, director and operational head of critical care services at CHL Hospital Indore, the largest corporate hospital in Madhya Pradesh. The second topic, nebulization, and the key component of that would be antibiotic nebulization, would be taken by Dr. Neeraj Tiyagi, uh, known, known to everybody. He is a consultant in uh, Sir Gangaram Hospital, one of the most prestigious hospitals for critical care in the country. And to moderate the session, we have Dr. Ranjit Chatterjee, sir. Sir is a senior consultant and in charge at Swami Dhyanand Hospital, Delhi, and is a veteran in uh, academics. So over to you, Dr. Ranjit Chatterjee, sir, uh, for the proceedings of the day. Uh, thank you, Tapesh, uh, for again calling me in your uh, forum. And I welcome both the great speakers here, Nikhilesh and Neeraj. And I'll start with Dr. Nikhilesh Jain's topic. Actually, he's going to speak. Both the topics are so important. But ultimately, if you see, we don't give that amount of when we importance to this most uh, intriguing topics because they are not so easy. And uh, uh, hardly you will find discussions on topics of humidification and nebulization. Many of us, we don't know how to nebulize properly when the patients are on ventilator. And we also don't know exactly which humidification device to select when uh, we are ventilating the patients or the patients are on non-invasive ventilation. So basically, we'll start with Nikhilesh Jain's topic, that is humidification. We, as we know, that humidification is a process of increasing the moisture content of the air. This is the simple definition. And whenever we are ventilating a patient, so we're pushing cool, dry air to the patients, that basically damages the respiratory epithelium. And that leads to a lot of accumulation of secretions, thick secretions, atelectasis, bronchospasm, and ultimately that leads to weaning failure. So, on the other hand, improper humidification or high, more uh, with high temperature also might cause damage to the respiratory epithelium. So, in order to give a clear insight to the whole topic about the different types of humidification, active, passive, etc., what are their contraindications or what are the latest guidelines, I'm sure that Nikhilesh will do justice to this subject. Dr. Nikhilesh, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. So, as we are already running late, uh, we will go over this topic and uh, why we should talk about it, you know. Humidity is actually the amount of water stored in a gas. Absolute humidity, I I mean these are the terms that we should know about. Absolute humidity is the mass of water vapor which is present in a given volume of gas and it is usually expressed in milligram per liter. Relative humidity is the amount of water vapor at a particular temperature expressed as a percentage of the amount that would be held if the gas were saturated. Absolute humidity is the mass of water vapor present in a given volume of gas and it is usually expressed in milligram per liter. Now, these terms can be very confusing. So, uh, relative humidity, and then another term is relative humidity is again, actually, is the amount of water vapor, I'm rehashing it, at a particular temperature expressed as a percentage of the amount that would be held if the gas were saturated. Remember these terms when we go through the rest of the presentation. So when we talk in terms of physiology, what really happens? Heat and moisture exchange. It it is actually a significant physiological function and is actually carried out in human beings by nasal tissue, more specifically the venous network that is available. And when we talk in terms of anatomic sites, these are roughly the sort of uh, humidity requirements which are there. Uh, These are the values. The references are very easily available on the net at nose or mouth level, at hypopharynx level, and at mid trachea level. Some more physiology. Now, what really happens? As the inspired air goes down the tract, it reaches, it actually reaches a point where its temperature is 37 degrees centigrade and relative humidity is 100%. Now, this is known as isothermic saturation boundary, and it is usually 
arbitrarily placed at 5 cm below the carina. At this point in time, there is a changeover from goblet cells and submucosal glands, which usually maintain the mucus layer and serve as an interface for exchange of humidity, to a network of cuboidal cells at the level of terminal bronchioles, which have lesser goblet cells and submucosal glands. So they are actually unable to provide for a similar quantum of humidification as the upper airways do. So in effect, yeah. as we go down the respiratory tract, the degree of humidification starts suffering or starts going down. So then we are going back to original premise. Uh, post intubation, uh, upper airways are bypassed actually, and this isothermic point is actually shifted further down. And as the capacity of humidification is poor, there's delivery of cold and dry gases, which leads to damage to respiratory epithelium, which further leads to increased work of breathing, greater chances of atelectasis more chances of bronchospasm and retention of secretions. So what to do? Of course, if you have to tackle this situation, you have to add humidifiers. Now, what are humidifiers? Humidifiers are basically devices which will add molecules of water to a gas. If it is active humidifier, then there would be an external source of heat and water. If it's a passive humidifier, then we use the patient's own temperature and hydration. So what are active humidifiers? Active humidifiers will act by allowing air passage inside a heated water reservoir. In this, you have to add water to the gas by passing the gas over a water chamber, either through a saturated wick, either you bubble it through water, or you mix it sort of with a vaporized water. Now, they are not meant to filter respiratory gases, unlike passive humidifiers, as we'll uh, take, as I'll take further down the presentation. And they can be either heated or unheated. So these are the components of a heated humidifier, wherein you see this, uh, this is a heated humidifier, this is a gas source, there's an outlet with a relative humidity of 100% and absolute humidity of 84, there's a water condensate in the tubing, and then it goes to the delivery site, which is the patient connection. And at the delivery site, again, relative humidity is 100% and absolute humidity is 44 milligrams per liter. Now, basically, a heated humidifier is a device to warm water or warm the inspiratory tube. You have to have a humidification chamber for water with a clear view. You have to have a heat source or a heating system in different forms. It can either be a hot plate element, it can be a wraparound element, it can be a collar element, immersion heater or a heated wire. Now, these are various modalities. I'm not going to go too much in detail for that. So, what else do we need to know about it? you need to have a temperature monitor to measure the gas temperature at the patient end of the breathing system. You need to have a thermostat, which can be either servo control or non-servo control. You need to have controls, which will allow temperature selection at the end of the delivery tube or humidification chamber outlet. And you need to have alarms in place. These alarms will actually help you in terms of temperature deviation, displacement of a probe, disconnection of heater wire, low water levels in humidification chambers, any lack of gas flow in the circuit, or if there's a faulty airway temperature probe, so that you can rectify the situation and tackle it accordingly. How does this whole assembly work, you know? Uh, this is meant to go to the inspiratory limb of ventilator circuit only. Gas is introduced, which is enriched with water vapor. It reaches from inspiratory limb to the patient's airway. Water traps are added to avoid accumulation of water vapor condensate. If you're using filter, then it should be placed upstream of humidifier. If you're using a maple sun system, it should be used in a fresh gas supply tube. If you're using a circle system, you use an add-on accessory tube. Next would be, so some more caveats for use would be, the humidifier should be at a lower level than the patient. This is to actually avoid the risk of water running down the tubing into the patient. The water vapor condensate must be drained periodically and a water trap inserted in the most dependent part of the tubing, ideally, to prevent any form of blockage or aspiration of this condensate. Heater, if there is a heater wire in the delivery tube, it should not be punched, but it should be strung evenly along the entire length of the tube. Delivery tube should not rest on other surfaces and it should not be covered with sheets, blankets, or other materials. If you want some support, either a boom arm or a tube tree can be used. So anything else to know about this? Advantages, whenever we use such humidifiers are, 
the capability to deliver saturated gas at body temperature or above even with high flow rates and in effect more effective humidification than heat and moisture exchanger which is a passive uh, device the disadvantages are that it is bulky sometimes the functioning becomes complicated you have to have maintenance costs you will have electrical hazards and you will have increased work in terms of uh, manpower uh, dedicated uh, interventions such as temperature control refilling the reservoirs draining the condensates cleaning that and sterilization so there are various designs and techniques for humidifiers such as bubble pass over counter flow and inline vaporizer i'm not going to go too much in detail for that um just a word about unheated humidifiers this is basically a flow meter that you see here disposable bubble through devices which are used to increase humidity in oxygen supplied to the patients given via a face mask or a nasal cannula basically these are simple containers which contain distilled water through which oxygen is passed and it gets humidified maximum humidity that can be achieved through this would be 9 mg of water per liter then you have passive humidifiers which mimic the action of nasal cavity in gas humidification you've got synonyms such as condenser humidifier you've got swedish nose nose humidifier regenerative humidifier vapor condenser which are used interchangeably for these the exchanging medium is enclosed in a plastic housing it has a variable size shape and a dead space you have pediatric and neonatal uh, hmes which have low dead space and they may have a port to attach a gas sampling line for respiratory gas monitoring which is usually placed between the et tube as well as the breathing et tube and the breathing circuit so points to remember would be here uh, you may get increased resistance to airflow during both the phases that is inspiration and expiration both while you are administering aerosolized medications hmes actually need to be removed from the circuit to avoid deposition they can be also used for tracheostomized patients and they are not meant for use concurrently with a heated humidifier nebulizer or multimeter drug inhaler should be inserted between the hme and the patient or if you are giving the aerosol treatment hme should be removed from circuit if the hme is contaminated with secretions please go ahead and replace it then there are certain designs of passive humidifiers which are older humidifiers basically they are condensers of metallic elements with high thermal conductivity and they could actually reuptake only 50% of exhaled moisture and provided humidification of 10 to 14 mg water per liter at tidal volumes between 500 ml and 1000 ml they are not disposable and they created a significant resistance during the mechanical ventilation so what about certain newer designs about in hmes well now you have newer designs hydrophobic wherein condenser has a water repelling element with a low thermal conductivity that maintains higher temperature gradients and it does allow passage of water vapor but not liquid water at usual ventilatory pressures you got a combined hydrophobic hygroscopic uh, device which is a, in which a hygroscopic salt that is either a calcium or lithium chloride is added inside a hydrophobic hme which has a chemical affinity to attract water particles and it actually increases the humidification capacity then you've got pure hygroscopic hmes wherein you have got wool or foam or paper like material which is coated with moisture retaining chemicals such as having a hygroscopic compartment and in exhalation vapor condenses in the element and hygroscopic salts while in inspiration water vapor is obtained from salts with a humidity between 22 and 34 mg of water per liter <clears throat> so this is just differences in a nutshell we are talking about uh, types of uh, device hygroscopic and hydrophobic depending on heat and moisture exchanging efficiency in effect of increased tidal volume on hme filtration efficiency when it is dry filtration efficiency when it is wet resistance when it is dry resistance when it is wet and effect of nebulized medications these are very commonly available on the net i'm not going through the entire thing but to summarize uh, with hygroscopic hygroscopic ones are supposed to be relatively better ones <coughs> advantages or disadvantages when we are talking in terms of advantages it is inexpensive it is easy to use small lightweight simple in design silent in operation do not actually require water or any external energy source or temperature monitors 
there's no uh, problem or issues with the alarms and there are no risks of overhydration hypothermia and there's no risk of any thermal injuries or electrical injuries disadvantages are that they can actually deliver humidity only up to a certain extent they cannot go over and above that temperature preservation may not be that significant and uh, it is definitely less active less effective than active humidifiers especially in those patients who are intubated for more than for uh, four days you can get increased dead space which actually necessitates increase in tidal volume and increased work of breathing it can actually predispose to really or volume induced lung injury as well contraindications for the same include thick or copious secretions loss of tidal volume in the form of cough leak or large dpf patients in ards on lung protective strategies or low tidal volumes patient is difficult to wean with limited reserve patient with high, uh, minute ventilations that is more than 10 hypothermic patients with body temperatures less than 22 degrees these are the contraindications now when we look at neonates if you want to use this hme with neonates the problems are that there is an increased dead space volume compared to tidal volume which can actually lead to hyperventilation for these patients you use uncuffed endotracheal tubes in uh, neonates and the leak can actually decrease the efficiency of hme incubator if you are planning to uh, use it concurrently with an incubator in place it can affect the performance of the hme as heated environment will decrease the inhaled or exhaled gas temperature gradient so this one more entity hmea for heated moisture exchanging filters wherein um they are mainly meant for bacterial and viral filtrations and uh, the means through which they do it one is electrostatic one is mechanical filtration and uh, the types for the same are treated in electrostatic again i'm not going to spend too much time on that uh for an active hme active heated water source is added to hmes which converts them to passive to active and increases their humidification capacities if the external source of water runs out if there is an active hme it will still continue to work as a passive hme again various types not going to go too much in detail booster booster device performer device a humid heat device and a concept of high grovent gold so what about the evidence you know whenever we talk in terms of humidification in mechanical ventilation um ARC clinical practice guidelines are there they had come in 2012 and since then there has been no major document that has come forward subsequently so it is definitely recommended for all patients who receive uh, mechanical ventilation invasive mechanical ventilation specifically for patients who are on NIV active humidification is suggested as it may improve the adherence and comfort and cooperation of the patient with invasively ventilated patients the device should provide a humidity level between 33 mg water per liter and 44 mg water per liter and gas temperatures between 34 to 41 degrees centigrade at the circuit wipes with a relative humidity of 100% in passive humidification to patients who are undergoing invasive mechanical ventilation it is suggested that you should have a hme which would provide a minimum of 30 mg of water per liter again passive recommend uh, passive humidification is not recommended for niv and providing humidification to patients with low tidal volumes specifically whenever we are using lung protective uh, ventilation strategies with low tidal volumes hmes are actually not recommended as they contribute to additional dead space which can increase the ventilator requirements and pacu there are certain small papers which have also come into that it is suggested that hmes actually should not be used as a prevention strategy or a preventive tool for preventing vaps now how do i monitor the performance of an hme you tell me that you gone ahead and put an hme how do i know whether this hme is working fine or not ideally you have to have a hygrometer thermometer system but uh, as it is not feasible and definitely not at bedside for most of the units uh, different surrogate markers are suggested and the most popular surrogates which are used at bedside are secretion characteristics visual observation of condensate in tubing system and requirement for saline distillation now the volume of secretions is directly proportional to the degree of humidification if there is excessive humidification it will increase the secretion volume and if there is suboptimal humidification it will lead to crusting inspissation of secretions along with a decrease in volume 
my problems with the above would be that secretion volumes can be actually altered by aerosolized medications. It can be altered by frequency of suctioning of a particular patient and whenever we decide to instill saline in those patients. As of now, there's still no clear consensus about a universal methodology to assess for humidity adequacy at the bedside. So whenever we talk in terms of what are the performance standards, any ideal performance standards, the design and performance standards are defined by the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO. And according to AARC guidelines, heated humidifiers should provide an absolute humidity level between 33 and 44 milligram water per liter, whereas HME should provide a minimum of 30 milligram water per liter. So points to remember would be, if you have to use an HME, you should ideally use a combined hydrophobic hygroscopic HME's first choice. If passive humidification is selected, as they have better humidification capacity than the hydrophobic ones. Most of the manufacturers recommend exchanging HMEs every 24 hours in case of long-term mechanical ventilation. But as a practicality, um, most of us probably tend to use them at least for 48 to 72 hours or unless there is any obvious soiling. HMEs are passive devices which require retention of heat to provide effective function. And if you have a hypothermic patient with temperatures lower than 32 degrees centigrade, using them is contraindicated. During anesthesia, Time duration of the bypass of upper airway is much shorter, so that needs to be factored in whenever you are using humidification. So how are ventilatory strategies affected? When I talk in context with humidification, it would be, you have increased dead space, which will actually decrease the alveolar ventilation, and it will lead to an increase in the PACA boost. So in order to keep the same level of alveolar ventilation, tidal volume has to be increased. Whenever I do that, it would lead to volume-induced lung injury, that is really. If you have a spontaneously breathing patient, the addition of dead space associated with HMEs may increase work of breathing, which can actually hamper weaning from mechanical ventilation. Now, HMEs, they actually increase both inspiratory and expiratory resistance, and it can contribute to development of intrinsicity. So, lessons to learn would be, airway humidification represents a key intervention in mechanically ventilated patients, but inappropriate settings or inappropriate devices may negatively impact your clinical outcomes by damaging airway mucosa, increasing your work of breathing, prolonging your mechanical ventilation. Now, these devices may function passively or actively depending on your source of heat and humidity. And depending on your clinical scenario, humidifier, humidifier selection may actually change over time for a particular patient. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nikolesh. Um, an excellent... Uh, way of expression of how exactly the humidification should be used in patients who are either mechanically ventilated or who are on an IV. Um, uh, I think uh, with the permission of Dr. Tapesh, we should dis continue the discussion for sir, this lecture first, followed by Neeraj's discussion. Yes, sir. I think, sir, your comments on humidification and yeah. humidification. I think, I think Neeraj and Nikolesh has told everything. Um, um, just uh, the most important part is that to select the proper humidifier in proper patients. For example, as you have already told the patients with a low tidal volume, where uh, the low tidal volume ventilation, if you're using an HME, basically it will increase the dead space, the carbon dioxide uh, content with the increase in this type of patients. Similarly, when you are using an NIV, you have told that either you don't use or you use a heated humidifier. But a corollary to this is that if you are using helmet as a NIV interface, if you're using a heated humidifier, it causes a lot of fogging inside the helmet. So known as a fogging syndrome, the fogging phenomenon of the helmet. So you just can't use a heated humidifier in a helmet. So there either you don't use or if at all you have no other choice, you have to use a, uh, this uh, uh, HMS. Now, as you have told that HMS has different types, hydroscopic, hydrophobic, hydroscopic, hydrophobic, and purely hydroscopic. So this hydrophobic type of uh, HMEs was found to occlude the endotracheal tubes. In different studies, it has been found the endotracheal tube occlusion occurs with hydrophobic HMEs. Still in India, we have a lot of manufacturers who are, who are providing you with hydrophobic HMEs. So when you are buying a HME, you should know exactly what which HME you are buying. It's just not that the technician is coming and attaching the HME, you don't see the HME at all. So this is very important, but endotracheal tube occlusion occurs with hydrophobic HMEs. 
compared to heat and humidifiers and hygroscopic HNS. And as patients who are hypothermic, in these type of patients, we've already told that the again the hypothermia may exacerbate in these type of patients. Similarly, a lot of dry heat might cause might be detrimental. So exactly you have to or less everything. I don't think that we have to add anything to this. Just on this point, two points. One is a hydrophobic because endotracheal occlusion, tube occlusion, and a fogging syndrome they occurred with helmet. So not to use heated humidifiers in helmet. I uh, I don't find any question out here. Uh, so uh, if the patient so just one more thing, and I think uh, overall the net outcome in results is no difference between HME and with your uh, heated humidifiers overall in the trials that have been conducted. The outcome does not vary, but for a few subsets, uh, wherever there's dead space increase or certain other conditions which are contraindications or uh, disadvantages, very specific disadvantages to HMEs. The overall uh, difference is not there between HMEs and heated uh, the humidifiers. And generally, we are using HMEs. Most of the ICUs are using HMEs. And uh, like you said, uh, you know, the maximum usage should not be more than seven to seven uh, seven days. Anything between seventy-two hours to seven days, we should be changing the HMEs. And if they are soil with secretions, etc., we should be careful that they should be changed. And one practical way of looking at uh, the uh, you know, adequate humidification is to see whether there is some condensate in the tubing. There should be a little condensate in the tubings. And if there is too much condensate, the tubings have to be changed because that leads to increased incidence of infections. Just a few points. And last point is about the secretions. You know, <laughs> we go at the bedside. It's a very common question. How are the secretions? Sister says secretions are thick. They are very tenacious. So does that have any implication on the humidification the mucin or mucus is 97 percent water a little bit is other molecules so yes thick secretions may mean dryness of the airways but not necessary so you check your humidification status which may be from the external sources maybe the patient is overall dry no? but thick secretions do not always mean that uh, you are not uh, humidifying, humidifying uh, properly, or there is uh, overall dehydration. Uh, that's just a few things from my side. So uh, I, th I think uh, Tapesh is right, and in, if you see the initial start when way back to 20 years before, it was it was uh, it was thought that heated humidifiers might be the source of infection and might might cause increased chances of ventilator associated pneumonias. But subsequent studies which came up in the later years and the Procan reviews, they have shown they have shown that these that, that thought process was wrong basically. They have not found much of difference between the rate of infection between use of heated humidifiers and HMEs. So that part now, so that is the reason from the VAP bundle that has been removed. Uh, so I think we can go on to the next topic uh, from here and um, no other than uh, our very dear friend, somebody's phone is. So, Dr. Tyagi, sir, uh, please, uh, over to you. Dr. Neeraj Tyagi is uh, known to all of us, and uh, he is a dear friend and a very active worker, and one of one of the most busiest ICUs in India, and um, he looks very cool out here, and um, the he is going to talk on the. Uh, on nebulization and meter dose inhalation. As we all know that the delivery of aerosols in a mechanically ventilated patients is completely a different ballgame. Uh, uh, it looks to be very easy. We tell our technicians just attach the nebulizer or attach the meter dose inhaler and give it to us. But exactly where to attach it, which which inhale, which machine are you are to go, uh, you are going to attach, what exactly are the amount of drugs that you're going to put so that they have a proper lung deposition? Whether you are going to cause any extra, giving any uh, extra doses to the patients, whether that has any role with the type of machines that you are using, where exactly you have to put it in the circuit, all these things, all these complicated matters will be discussed by Neeraj. Over to you, Neeraj. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tapesh and Dr. Ranjit and Dr. Nikhilesh. I need a bit of help. I think my presentation is not getting uploaded. Is it a way I can share my screen? 
Muzaffer, please help, sir. Then option is there. Uh, below the netcast service logo, there is a plus icon, tools icon. Share screen is there. Okay, I got it. Um, uh, it's below the white. Select yeah. the entire screen. And I got it. Okay. So I think it's uh, all visible. Yes, yes, very well visible. Yes, perfect. So the topic that's been assigned to me is uh, nebulize, and and as Dr. Tapesh said, and uh, Dr. Ranjit rightly pointed out, this is not too fashionable a topic that we talk too often in ICUs. But mind you, when this topic was assigned to me, and I went back and looked at the literature, there's certain great things. So before we go to thing, uh, let's talk about the delivery status and. Uh, most of us are still using disposable nebulizers unless my ventilator like most of the hamiltons and dragers nowadays uh, they have a dedicated port for nebulization we are forced to use disposable nebulizers and uh, obviously we know that medications there are multiple drugs a formulation and a delivery device which is engineered to guarantee an accurate dose or delivery to the lungs for example when we are using a, a meter dose inhalers with every puff, you know, the amount of drug which is likely to get deposited. And we have uh, robust studies which tell, okay, 15 to 70% is deposited in the oral mucosa and so on and so forth. And 85% around reaches the lungs. And then we can decipher how much of it can get deposited in the upper airways and how much it actually goes to uh, lower uh, resistance airways. And if at all we are using a uh, a nebulizer or inhaler, how much of it is going to reach actually the LVLI. This is not the same when we talk about aerosolization, which happens in a mechanically ventilated patient, because this technique depends on how much is the local duct concentration. And the idea is to keep that local duct concentration as minimal as possible so that the systemic side effects are not felt. So if I need to use albuterol in as high a dose as it's the IV dose, then there is no point giving it in a nebulization form. The other aspect of it is we'll, we'll be discussing later is to ensure effective delivery to that to achieve desired clinical effect at the site itself. For example, it is not so important for airways, but when we talk about inhaled antibiotics or anti-infectives in particular, it is important that they reach the entire airway as well as alveoli because infection is not limited to airway which is the major site of action of rest of the inhaled bronchodilators and it should not provoke any intolerable adverse effects for example if we are um, nebulizing an antibiotic and it produces bronchospasm then the entire effect is negative so uh, what are the characteristics that make a medication suitable for aerosolizations? We will go there eventually, but let's talk about nebulizers. And when we talk about nebulizers, we need to understand that modern devices is still, they are able to achieve lung deposition fraction of maximum 50%. Okay. It is way above, you can see even thrice or five times what it was earlier, but yeah, it still does not exceed 50%. And uh, nebulizers, they typically generate aerosols during the entire respiratory cycle of the patient. So, my patient is inhaling or exhaling, but nebulizer is giving that kind of aerosol. But uh, we understand that when we are exhaling, the amount of aerosol will not enter my lungs, but it will get exhaled. So, it is more of drug distribution in the ambient atmosphere rather than in my lungs. The newer nebulizers, they utilize electronic control and they are sort of try to personalize aerosolization to the individual patient's breathing pattern. Uh, this you will see typically in, in all the modern race drivers. And these nebulizers are known as adaptive aerosol delivery systems. And these are certain ones which you will find most often being used in our European ICUs. Uh, these systems are not being used for antimicrobials, but now we have customized uh, antimicrobial system which can be 
somehow added to any kind of ventilator that we are using. So this is what we most of the times end up using in our uh, institutions, be it on uh, in in an you can say synchronized fashion. If you have a dedicated uh, nebulizer port on our ventilator or through a nebulizer device per se. The biggest problem with the nebulizer device per se and probably we, if we have time, if it, it permits, we'll discuss, is the additional flow apart from the ventilator flow which goes into the machine and the machine uh, has a different flow which is being put through inspiration while the exhalation side is feeling a much higher flow. So it needs to make adjustment both about tidal volume delivery and the flow measurements as they are coming from inspiratory side and being experienced at the expiratory side. So then we all know how they produce. It's a compressed gas. It's primarily a venturi mechanism. And then um, uh, because it's a very simple mechanism, they have very low cost. Their efficiency is uh, being tested since a very long time. And obviously because the cost is low, we can use this in disposable fashions. And large particles within the reservoir, they condense on the top of chamber. They drip back onto the reservoir. So most of the times, the medication waste is minimal. But the disadvantage is this, this device typically needs 15 to 20 minutes of nebulization to give 4 to 5 ml of that amount of uh, liquid that we need to reconstitute the medicine in. Similarly, the fill volume, air flow, and pressure and the choice of either continuous or intermittent use, depending if I'm using a nebulizer machine per se, and my, my uh, ventilator is not engrossed with intermittent use or operation adaptive use, obviously is going to be a continuous supply. Where we're gonna place it in the ventilator circuit, the solution properties, and as Dr. Ranajit pointed out, if we can integrate a spacer, it will affect output. So. This is how it happens. The, uh, the, the next thing came was ultrasonic nebulizer. So instead of having a venturi effect, it had a piezoelectric crystal which vibrates at high frequency. And this this is something like um, uh, if you if you pour a, uh, any any carbonated drink or even an alcoholic drink on ice, you understand how the particles break and they result in aerosolization. So the medication output is directly proportional to the crystal's vibration amplitude. And this vibration amplitude and the crystal thing is what decides the cost. And the droplet size is inversely proportional to vibration frequency. So it's more of a trade-off. If, if the frequency is high, then you will have time which is less. So you will have, you can say, a football size particle, obviously, which can be deposited into the lungs in probably five minutes but if you drop that size of football to a tennis ball obviously it's going to take at least thrice the time uh, it was taking earlier so advantages are obviously short administration time disadvantages cost obviously the cost prohibits it to be being a disposable ones it needs routine cleaning and uh, the stability of medication is uh, usually not tested for all of them because as we understand anything which vibrates at a very high speeds is going to generate heat and that heat has potential to disintegrate certain medication if not all so uh, uh, if we can summarize about ultrasonic ones the jet nebulizers and will come why the size of particle that is being generated by a particular nebulizer is important they have a high a larger particle size but they need a shorter operating time. The operating time becomes very important when a patient is on mechanical ventilator. So this is what a jet nebulizer uh, should be given ideally to a patient. So most important thing we, before we nebulize anyone is to ensure that there are no secretions present in the endotracheal tube. In an in a intubated patient, endotracheal tube becomes the narrowest part of our upper airway and maximum amount of, of particles are going to get deposited into this area, more so if it turns narrower or stickier because of presence of any secretions. Second thing is to return off flow by or continuous flow during nebulizer because what will happen, this continuous flow starts from the inspiratory side and goes to the expiratory side and the aerosol, rather than going only into the endotracheal tube, gets exposed to the area or path of least resistance and will bias bypass by endotracheal tube. 
the fifth one is slightly debated nowadays where to place the nebulizer but the most important aspect when we discuss this thing in detail is to remove hme from circuit but if you have a uh, other kind of wet humidifier there is no need to disconnect it uh, use a ventilator if 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 it meets the nebulizer flow requirements because most of the nebulizers they need a much lower flow and uh, if 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 your ventilator gives too much of alarm or it is too sensitive in terms of expiratory flow uh, most of the times the dragers have this problem if you add a external flow device to a dragger uh, the external flow sensor keeps tripping it keeps giving you alarm and it reduces the amount of inspiratory flow to reduce inspiratory tidal volume because what it is experiencing is increased expiratory tidal volume and it tries to cut on the flow so you end up hypoventilating your patient during the entire duration of nebulization and this has to be remembered by all of us because the duration typically used in a jet nebulization is not insignificant it is 10 to 15 minutes can you imagine in hypoventilation in a otherwise compromised patients we need to tell the nurses to look at nebulizer during the entire time and see what is happening with the amount of fluid which is there when we are removing the nebulizer obviously we need to rinse it with sterile water and we need to run it dry most of the times they become a source of colonizations if they are left wet with even sterile water or saline and and we we should recollect humidifier that it's a no brainer and obviously we need to monitor patient for any kind of ad adverse effects uh, in comparison uh, when we talk about mesh nebulizers uh, mm -hmm. most important thing is they uh, they are more like cars they look same but we need to see what the manufacturer's instructions are there is an exhaustive list uh, but uh, about similarities in most of mechanically ventilated patient if we are not able to get them in a erect or semi erect position at least they should be somehow in 15 to 30 degrees head up and uh, as it goes with jet nebulizer every time we are done with that treatment we need to disassemble a mesh nebulizer as well the final one is which is being propagated most is a vibrating mesh so what it typically does it it uses a good thing of both jet as well as ultrasonic ones so because this this liquid droplets are produced by a mesh which is actively vibrating the amount of heat generated is far less and uh, so they are able to give a higher rate of nebulization than the ultrasonic ones and the 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 um, the size of particle is also smaller uh, so advantage obviously is less heat and consistency in the particle size this advantage is obviously uh, the, 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 the potential for obstruction and damage to nebulizer through a high concentration because we need to use a highly concentrated uh, liquid. For example, if we use uh, a volume of 4 to 6 ml in jet nebulizer, that, that volume goes down to 0.5 to 1 ml. Uh, so this is a potential disadvantage. So uh, this is uh, briefly summarizing what we have discussed so far. And now we'll come to why we need to be so so concerned about the humidity. So what happens whenever, as we see, there is so much of talk about pollution and the particles in the suspended air, the moment it is the winter season in Delhi or any of the metros. What happens in winters? Typically, it's not the temperature which drops. It also makes the, the relative humidity drop. So air becomes much dry and it allows the particles to stay suspended. Let's think the reverse of it when we are giving aerosol. The idea of aerosol is to travel as far as possible into the lungs. So they need to remain light. The moment we introduce humidity in the ventilating circuit, it increases the amount of aerosols, which becomes heavier. And so they tend to deposit much earlier they will deposit more in the endotracheal tube then in the trachea and then in the larger bronchus and bronchioles as compared to in case of when we talk about bronchodilators into the respiratory bronchioles the moment we add heat it further is going to further decrease because 
condensation will happen as heat starts to or temperature starts to go down and they will drop so efficiency of jet and ultrasonic nebulizers they can be improved by spacer as well as by reducing both the heat as well as humidity and that's the reason anybody who is having hme use rather than a, a wet humidification they should be removed at the start of nebulizer therapy this is far more important when it comes to pulmonary debris of antibiotics because uh, the efficiency of nebulizer systems are essential to attain therapeutic efficacy as well as to keep the time needed for administration uh, to less than 30 minutes the reason we say the time should be less because we can assume if we need to interrupt the nebulization therapy in any patient who is mechanically ventilated if i cannot disconnect the circuit for 30 minutes and my patient starts to cough or there are pent up secretions we it is almost as bad as missing a iv dose of antibiotic so to reduce the nebulization time is important there is a big debate why we need to use antibiotics particularly why in vamp so we all should understand whenever we talk about lower respiratory tract infections they are difficult to treat due to the sequestration of microorganisms within the airway till the alveoli and if we are giving iv drugs it is a very limited portion which gets access to these airways airways as well as alveoli when when we talk about gram negative organisms and we know aminoglycosides are one of the most wonderful drugs that can be utilized against the gram negatives apart from beta lactam the aminoglycosides they have very poor pulmonary penetration and that's why we talk about drug dosaging uh, once a day and highest possible dose as per the renal clearance or creatinine level or kidney function test whichever way you want to call it uh, of uh, aminoglycosides to be used when hypoxia occurs in pneumonia the other problem comes the pulmonary vaso vascular vasoconstriction shunts the blood away from the disease area so the systemic drug is being delivered more to the good side of the lung rather than the pathological side of the lung and at the end poor penetration which and apart from what happens when you have a thick layer of mucosa and and, and the alveolar or pulmonary barrier coming to picture makes us the, the lung concentration of so many antibiotics so low so the moment we give all these antibiotics in inhaled fashion they may still be able to achieve the required kpd for example when we talk about gentamicin a systemic versus inhaled you can see the difference it was less than 1 mg per liter yes, and it reached more than 400 mg per liter almost 400 times and when we talk about uh, aminoglycosides which which progress their activity by maximum concentration so we see it is almost effective for mics up to 40 mg again 100 times much more than what they were effective in terms of systemic therapy so this is the obvious advantage of using inhaled antibiotics in vap particularly and this is the reason the Spanish Antibiogram Committee has recommended specific breakpoints for inhaled antibiotics, particularly topiramycin. And they say the resistance breakpoint, otherwise, which is less than 16, can be said as high as more than 128 milligram per liter. Okay. So when we talk about which antibiotics, can we make any antibiotic be used in an inhaled fashion? No. So we need to use the PKPD principles very diligently and intelligently as well. So antibiotics with concentration dependent effects, for example, aminoglycosides, they are typically chosen for aerosolization because what happens at the moment we nebulize a patient, that the, the, the concentration of the drug is going to remain highest in the peri-nebulization phase. Then the lung defenses, for example, macrophage, they will, they will somehow exhume all the large side particles the smaller ones, they will get deposited, and the very small ones, they won't even reach the area where they're intending to reach. We'll discuss this in details. And uh, that's why the time-dependent antibiotics, they are not their great ones to be nebulized.
something typically like that we it's it's again a, a very simple common sense kind of a thing that yes if we are able to have a certain drugs for which the bacteria is susceptible and we can use them in inhalational forms at least that is going to be uh, ventilator associated tracheal bronchitis as well is going to be very very amenable to inhaled antibiotics what are the particular practical issues so most of the times the clinicians do not appreciate the complexity because uh, our primary defense system is designed to protect anything which is capsulized the size is high the idea of enable and defense is to throw it out so the mucociliary barrier and the ciliary whatever is getting deposited in the upper airway minus the endotracheal tube they will try to throw it towards the oropharynx the moment we put the endotracheal tube we do blunt this but this reflex doesn't go away completely second thing what happens is when they talk about optimization of aerosol medications the airway they designed to and all these factors uh, when when we consider will this next slide is self explanatory so in this slide we will say let's the larger droplets we will get because it is the airway we see why they are less like to reach the distal airway while uh, if you talk about size which is like a 2 micrometer on an ap they will reach the parent tracheal area and this is why it happens if we look at the first one and if we see uh the the largest one they are likely to drop down or settle in the larger airways while the smaller ones they will bypass both uh, the b one is if you can see is a pain a healthy one and c one is probably something that is from the friction so if we are using some as a purpose of your bronco directly the particle size should be between less than 5 but more than 1 micrometer because this is what we say if we are anything do something which works again yeah that the drug suit the alveoli as well to so it keep to at the 50 50 kind of concentration of 1 micro The particle, as well as particles which are less than five micrometers, so that both airways as well as my alveoli will get saturated with the right amount of drug. The second thing which comes is a a, a bigger challenge in a patient who is having diseased lung. So. if we look at figure c this patient is having a considerable lung disease in one lobe and it is he is inhaling quickly and deeply so the disease lobe has a higher air resistance because the the the, the airway of the disease lungs are inflamed they are narrow and that's why if you see more drug is getting to the better lung because expansion of disease lobe is slower relative to the healthier part and preferential flow is happening to the healthier lobe so it's so integrate that when we are giving nebulized antibiotics the flow and the mode that we choose on a mechanical ventilator is, is suitable to the patient in that particular stage and this is the difference which gets displayed in patients so when we talk about <clears throat> survival benefit or bacterial eradication or clinical improvement that is why in patients who are getting mechanically ventilated you will see all of this versus in those who are having more of airway involvement and are on ventilator <clears throat> the the drugs and the list of them which are being used for nebulizer is exhaustive and we can find it everywhere we all know uh, all these drugs which are used and, and these are the devices uh, which are used so this is what we can conclude till now the the ideal inhaled antimicrobial it has to be manufactured in such a fashion that it has a high molecular mass 
it is lipophilic and it is positively charged and the efficiency definitely depends on how much after applying all these consideration this gets deposited in the patient's lung <clears throat> The, the answer to when to administer nebulized antibiotics and cholestin and map is, is probably in a situation where we have VAP due to MDR GNBs, which are amenable to probably these two classes of drug. And we have preparations which are suitable for nebulization. And the reason we say this is this. When we talk about systemic diffusion of nebulized aminoglycosides, most of the times what we understand because we are using the drug in the nebulized form, this will not get systematically absorbed. But this is a, a big misconception. The amount of drug remains active till the concentration is higher about, about MIC and Cmax. But the drug once it is delivered to the lung, gets continuously absorbed in the body and it has almost similar if not same potential to cause nephrotoxicity or all kind of side effects as drug which is given being given systematically. So what we need to understand that the peak plasma concentration is observed one hour down the line following nebulizations and it is almost a bicompartment time dependent decrease. So the trough plasma concentration which determine the toxicity risk, they are similar to those as they result in the intravenous administration. That is why it is important to consider the drug dosages of nebulized aminoglycosides as well. While the systemic diffusion of nebulized cholestin is very weak, even if the presence of extensive VAP, so uh, uh, all kind of uh, polymyxins they can be delivered at very high dosages by nebulization while when we talk about aminoglycosides total daily drug dose needs to be kept the way we will keep systemic drug dose and uh, we need to be talking a lot about drug prepared and manufactured specifically for inhalation uh, if you look uh, I will not name them because uh, I may sound biased towards those manufacturers, but there are three manufacturers only as far as I know whose pocket insert in terms of cholestin says that they this preparation can be used both IV as well as inhalational way. Most important thing is preservatives should be avoided if possible and we should be aware about, we'll discuss that again in detail, what kind of preservatives are almost contraindicated. If we go to the literature, we'll find certain case reports of, of fatality being reported post cholesterol nebulization. The reasons are, are less well understood, but bronchospasm and uh, anaphylactic reactions are both reported. So. Uh, we, we we discussed this with, so we will not repeat. So this is what we can talk about. If we talk about the literature, the ESMID position paper recommended avoiding the routine use of nebulized antibiotics in VAP due to a questionable efficacy. And the problem with this review is they considered all kind of delivery systems. They call they considered all kind of delivery doses, and they pegged entire evidence or or whatever studies were there into a single one. They did not consider adequate delivery, adequate dosaging, and most importantly, right kind of antibiotics which were chosen to be delivered in the inhalational form. And this is why in 2018, the French Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care Medicine, they published guidelines and they said that in hospital acquired pneumonia and intensive care unit, Nebulized cholestin and or aminoglycoside can be used in monotherapy if your MDR GNB is susceptible to cholestin. So the whole idea of stressing this point is do not get biased by the, the, the contrasting recommendations from various societies. We need to understand the basis and the considerations 
when those recommendations were made and if you look when we talk about right kind of antibiotics in right dosages you will see a decrease in the emergence of mdr bacteria was reported when these in inhaled antibiotics were used with an intent to reduce incidence of vamp all right uh, and in so many situations when they were combined with IV formulations in, as adjuvant therapies, higher clinical resolution rate of VAP was seen. So, mind you, when we talk about antibiotics and, and infection resolution, it is all about right dosages and right antibiotics. So, same principles, they always apply to inhaled antibiotics as well. So, this is we have discussed, so we can skip this slide and we'll go further. A classical quote from Henry Ford. If I, if, if when Henry Ford was making cars, if we go to that, the colossal picture of uh, New York. So you have horse cars and horse shit all over New York roads. And Henry Ford said people, all they would want was faster horses and faster carriages. They would never dream that cars can be made so affordable as well as so efficient. Those days, mind you, a good horse could be fetched say, somewhere in a thousand dollars while the car was costing eight hundred dollars. So cars were in fact cheaper than horses, but they were considered inefficient. So they were never in use. That's the reason we need to optimize nebulization to maximize anti uh, antibiotic lung deposition. And this is the reason we need to have inspiratory flow velocity so that we can reduce inertial impaction in the airways and we optimize the lung deposition. And that's one reason why volume control mode should be preferred to pressure control mode when we talk about nebulizing a patient with antibiotics. If we have facility to use mesh nebulizers, obviously we should use it. And uh, when we talk about ventilator settings, obviously if, if the cost is huge considerations uh, but when if we are using mesh nebulizers in particular it's wiser to invest in those tubings as well as placement somewhere around 10 to 15 centimeter before the y piece on the inspiratory limb because it saturates the inspiratory limb and it allows that gases in the inspiratory limb to go and keep getting deposited as per the particle size in most of the airways till the alveoli we have discussed about HME is to be removed and operating procedure should be clearly discussed with the bed size nurse. So this again, uh, it is more of a repetition, but when, when we should uh, remember these things are really, really important, switching off and optimizing humidity uh, or rather disappearance of humidity and heat when we are trying to nebulize. Clinical response rate is the most important thing because what happens is, is like um, particularly in cystic fibrosis that microbiological eradication because most of our understanding comes from cystic fibrosis. Uh, in cystic fibrosis, the idea of nebulization was not clinical improvement but was to reduce the number of repeated infections by decreasing the load of bacteria which were present in the airways. Same kind of corollary, and that's the reason when, when we talk about looking at the evidence base that generates a recommendation is really important. So we should not consider all those microbiological eradication studies when we talk about efficacy or efficiency of inhaled antibiotics, particularly regarding treatment of VAM. We've discussed certain uh, adverse effects of aerosolized antibiotics in terms of systemic toxicity, but uh, particular to aerosolization, cough, wheezing, hemopsis, and dyspnea. These, these effects are more in, in patients who are having inhalational antibiotics being delivered through mass, but uh, refractory bronchospasm is also known in, in patients who are in... Um, on mechanical ventilation the other thing is when we're considering compound they sh it is it's wise that if they can have a high fast pass hepatic elimination because if the drug gets absorbed in blood 
and they were high for spasmodic elimination the chances of toxic uh, levels being delivered to other tissues uh, they go down why high uh, hydrophobicity or uh, lipophilicity is required is required to decrease the dissolution rate and prolong lung surface contact before the thing gets absorbed in the system more hydrophilic or water soluble solvent the thing is easier it is for it to get into the blood stream more lipophilic it is likely to stay in the lung mucosa and surfactant for a much longer time so liposome formulation that's why they need to be explored and this is the classical example what it shows uh, the figure on the right if you see uh, the sine waves they are bacilli pseudomonas aeruginosa and when we talk about a patient who is suffering from web we understand that the entire airway is colonized with this and we have a as high a concentration of this bacilli in the alveoli as is there in the airways but when we talk about the position of inhaled antibiotics we can see on the figure on the left that the maximum deposition is there in the trachea and then least amount is reaching the small airways and the concentration in the lungs is almost abysmally low and this is the reason we need to ensure right kind of ventilatory settings and right kind of nebulization time as well as particle size to ensure the drug delivery to the intended level of tissue so this is a, a beautiful article which came on respiratory medicine they concluded about wet that inhaled antibiotics they have very important role in treatment of wet <clears throat> they can be used as monotherapy in patients who have clinical signs uh, and they show less of pneumonia and they have gram negative isolate which is sensitive so for wet monotherapy in inhaled form for susceptible bacteria works as well as systemic if not better than that those patients who are being treated with systemic antibiotics alone for wet uh inhaled antibiotics should always be added and the advantage is dual they will have faster microbiological eradication they reduce the chances of wet turning into wrap when it comes to dosages obviously the doses is they have to be equivalent uh, to the systemic therapy for particularly gram negative nosocomial pneumonia all those spanish guidelines they suggest that uh, we can reduce the dosages because uh, the mic is uh, which are getting displayed in terms of systemic ones they are far lesser but this is a, that's a lone ranger kind of a phenomena so i will stay shy of recommending it matthew felegas who has done maximum work when it comes to mdr as in so vector and and when we look at the literature particularly coming from europe he is one guy uh, probably we all should consider wisest of all in terms of generating Uh, any kind of evidence so when they, he has extensively used uh, colistin and they concluded that inhaled therapy alone should not be excluded as an option in certain patient situations particularly when we talk about for example there so many times when we when we are having web nowadays uh, particularly in touch care centers in metros the mdr bulbs they are sensitive either to very high dosages of uh, amino glycosides or to cholesterol they are resistant to all other classes so uh, this is what felega says this is the situations where one should always consider giving inhaled antibiotics so th this again we can skip this uh, this is we have discussed the duration of therapy is almost uh, as same as for systemic therapy for example if we use for 7 days in non mdr bugs yeah it could be 7 days but if it is 14 days particularly for uh, mdr bugs like pseudomonas the inhalation therapy should be of same duration if we extubate the patient prior to end of sy uh, systemic therapy and we have started on inhaled therapy we should continue to administer the inhaled agent via nebulization or any which form for the entire duration in totality 
So this is summary so far. Most important things uh, for a nail delivery of antibiotics are ventilatory settings. The ideal tidal volume is 500 ml uh, to increase lung deposition. Uh, we need to have longer inspirate free time. There are certain situations where we need to keep the tidal volume low. Obviously, uh, in those situations, what we need to see is to reduce infl inspiratory flow rate. Ideal is somewhere around 40 liters per minute. And if we are able to synchronize them, that means the ventilatory fitness the facility rather than the continuous stabilization, it will help us uh, get the thing deposited into the alveoli. So all this is an important for AP rather than DHC. And nebulizer placement is very important when we talk about mesh nebulizers in particular. So this is the final part of presentation. I know gold directed therapy is, is has gone out of scope and out of fashion, but this terminology is really important because this allows me to deliberate upon and assess what is being effectively being done. So these are eight very simple goals. We need to assure drug delivery. We need to optimize deposition in the lung. We need to provide consistent dosaging, which will depend on multitude of factors. For example, if, if a nurse in the morning shift nebulizes the same 6 ml for 10 minutes, and the residual volume after 10 minutes is 3 ml, only half of the drug has gone. While the evening nurse, if she is giving the nebulization therapy of six, same 6 ml for 30 minutes, three times the morning dose is being delivered. We need to avoid inappropriate therapies, so we should be very, uh, very, very uh, diligent about choosing antibiotic, which one. And obviously, we need to employ clinically feasible methods and control the cost of aerosol therapy. So, this is, this is again, uh, to recollect what we saw in the first slide in patient who was spontaneously breathing versus mechanically ventilated patient. And, and this is, again, we, we understand that uh, in mechanically ventilated patient, it, it is humidity and the temperature which is far higher. The flow is as a constant flow, which is controlled by the ventilator. And there is presence of artificial airway. And all these concentrations, considerations, they need to be optimized. Uh, for example, when we talk about increasing the dosages or delivery time, it is very easily done from bronchodilator's point of view. But if we need to give antibiotics, particularly aminoglycosides, which are getting systematically absorbed uh, after delivery into the lungs, the drug toxicity is a major, major consideration. So in giving thrice the dose of uh, tobramycin or inhaled amikacin is out of question all the time. Uh, the, well, try to explain. This, this is just that um, the, the presentation gets loaded, or, or if you search the net, this is these are the components of uh, gold directed nebulization therapy. So, uh, the most important thing is to keep uh, nebulization or delivery time as less as possible. Remove HME filter. Pin it properly. Tidal volume we have discussed, we've already discussed the flow time. And in terms of patient's position, uh, synchronization and avoiding interruptions are, are very important uh, when, when we talk about consistent dosing. Uh, intravenous formulations, they should always be avoided because uh, the, when we talk about concentrations uh, for inhalation, the, if, so solutions which are bland, which do not have chloride in them, uh, which, which, which are not having enough cations in them, they are more likely to irritate the bronchial mucosa and they are, they are likely to produce enough cough and bronchospasm. Similarly, when we talk about preservatives like the disodium, ethylene, uh, diamond tetracycline acid or uh, benzyl alkaline chloride which which are there in, in solvents of so many antibiotics they can produce major bronchoconstrictions when we talk about topiramycin uh, and topiramycin induced uh, bronchospasm mind you that is amenable to albuterol but uh, these kind of things they are not so the efficiency of drug delivery or antibiotic delivery in particular when we and if that that's 
preparation is introducing bronchospasm. It is very easy to imagine that most of the drug will remain in the constricted airways rather than reaching the infected material line. So we need to have formulations which do not produce bronchoconstrictions or bronchospasm at all. Uh, circuit contamination and frequent disconnections are again a very important aspect, but more than that, particularly those who are using Draegers is blockage of expiratory filters. So most of these drugs, uh, they can produce obstruction of the filter and ma the machine senses it more like you know, uh, a situation which is generating uh, flow which is differential from the inspiratory one and they keep increasing the flow which can in, can lead to almost like a situation of autopy and and since the expiratory flow is getting limited due to blockage of expiratory filter you may have pneumothorax so expiratory filter should always be checked if patient is having unexplained acute bronchospasm or development of auto peep uh, if you will you can see the expiratory flow not returning to baseline as the nebulization goes on and on so many times nurses what they used to do they used to turn off flume monitoring mind you that's the most dangerous thing to do in a patient who is being nebulized the nurses they do it in order to silence the alarm but if if we understand this is how it's gonna work and adversely affect then we should somehow educate them and sensitize them not to do that practice at all in the ICU. This is the end of my presentation, so we can take any questions if they are left at all. Thank you, Dr. Neeraj. I think you have extensively covered everything. We don't have to ask you any questions here. But also that shows your experience working with the ventilators, with the EVT4 machine of Dragon, which really causes problem. And yes, the nurses, they set the alarms off and sometimes we seriously hyperventilate these type of patients. But with the newer machines of Dragon that has come up, like the EVT4, like the smart care machines that has come up, they have, they have actually overcome these problems. So uh, with the newer machines, I think we don't face these problems. And uh, I I don't think that we have to ask you. You have told everything. What is your personal experience about using some inhaled antibiotics? Your personal so uh, we uh, this this is again uh, we learned it the hard way because when uh, colistin was introduced, only one manufacturer said that their colistin can be used in in uh, in a nebulized way, and we we somehow. Uh, tended to use all cholestins in the same fashion and we did see a lot of them causing problem to the expiratory flow a lot of them causing a bronchospasm uh, fortunately there was not any mortality related to this but this is yeah these are actually uh, the incidence is not negligible at all okay that's nice uh, so, dr tapesh i don't think that uh, we have any questions here yeah i think uh, yes, uh, dr neeraj has covered very nicely just one thing dr neeraj if you could just highlight the kind of ventilator settings you should be having for antibiotics you have covered it bits and pieces but just as a general guide for young fellows what kind of ventilatory settings would you advise when you're delivering cholesterol or aminoglycosides so the most important thing is to choose the mode of a uh, ventilator as I said, it has to be a volume control mode. And in a volume control mode, particularly those who are using Draegers, you have to switch off auto flow. You have to adjust the flow rate uh, by yourself. Keep it somewhere around 40 if it allows. If you have a patient who is having, a, a, you can say, airway resistance disease, then try to keep it somewhere around 50 liters per minute. Always make sure that... Uh, your inspiratory time because particularly in COPD patients, we keep it very small. So if we are using inhaled antibiotics, we need again a trade-off between tidal volume. Try to go up on tidal volume so that you can increase the rate. You can decrease the rate, but you can increase the inspiratory time. All the machines, they have two kind of uh, instructions. If you can go to the manuals about 
uh, the kind of tidal volume as well as the rate you need to have. For example, Gregor says the rate has to be there for more than 15 breaths per minute. Ideal, they say, is 20 breaths per minute because the default nebulization time on a particular ventilator is anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes. And the amount of volume one is making needs to be delivered in that particular time. So whenever we are using any of these ventilatory settings, we should be really, really aware of the manufacturer's guideline. Third aspect is presence of peep and bias flow. Uh, so the uh, when we talk about optimization, peep again comes from continuous flow and um, higher is the peep, more is the continuous flow. And obviously there is going to be loss of drug in the expiratory phase. But this is again a decision that needs to be taken by the clinician, whether my patient needs that amount of PEEP or it can be cut down during the short duration of nebulization therapy or I need to tell my nurse to repeat nebulization therapy till the um, entire amount of drug is delivered. So if it is a simple instruction like give a single nebulization versus finish the nebulization so then probably the nurse needs to go back to the ventilator and switch on the nebulizer um, button one more time or maybe twice more for the drug to get finished. Okay. Thank you, sir. So that should be clear to our audience who have to set the ventilator when we are delivering. Uh, <laughs> now, just uh, yes, on my side, sir, about the paper, the paper which was published in intensive care medicine. Now, there is a lot of controversy over the efficacy of uh, nebulized antibiotics, right? Like, sir, as you told me. But the last uh, real evidence has come out uh, six months ago uh, in intensive care medicine. Uh, he has shown the paper uh, where they have uh, very beautifully done uh, uh, nebulization with cholestin and amikacin in experimental animals. And they have found clear cut evidence of benefit. This evidence so far has been lacking in humans because of various reasons. The trials have to show evidence and there are problems with trials. He has mentioned your head, the way to deliver the dose, the kind of dosing, the, the selection of patients, so on and so forth. So the, 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 the thing is here is cholesterol when you give intravenous, it's a very low concentration in the lungs, right? So how do you give cholesterol? So the dose is 4.5 million units BD nebulized along with 9 million IV. That is the dose for cholestin if you're going to use it with nebulization. And for amikacin, the dose in this paper published six months ago is a beautiful paper. I shared this paper on a telegram group for those of you who are on the telegram group. The dose for amikacin is 40 milligram per kg once a day. Per kg. Okay. Yeah. It make it more practical. Right. Right, right, sir? You have also yes, exactly. So this is this is the dose and and there are two RCTs which are going on probably by end of this year we'll have human data as well. Yes. So I think in the right setting and with the right ventilatory settings, go ahead with the cholesterol nebulization with IV cholesterol and if you want to use amikacin nebulized with another drug in difficult situations. I think right now the 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 evidence is in favor and we should not hesitate from using it. If from, uh, uh, given the right kind of setting the setup and the understanding which Dr. Neeraj sir has provided to all of us. So I think those were my final words and uh, thank you everybody. Uh, thank the audience and uh, the recording will be up there on YouTube for everybody to review and for all our members and the other people who want to watch it. Thank you everybody and let's uh, I think enjoy the thank match. You. It should be a cracker of a match with my favorites in New Zealand. Uh, Nira, your favorites? <laughs> New Zealand. Yes, I think New Zealand is a very sensible team. And they've been winning all, yes, these, yes. Uh, all the trophies. They're Williamson great. has, Will, Dhoni is given a lot of credit for his captaincy, but I think Williamson is right up there. <laughs> it is, it is, uh, yes, so sure, so sure. So, bye bye and uh, have yeah. a nice enjoy, weekend. Enjoy the you. match and enjoy I think the match. Uh, thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, audience. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Sipla, for providing the digital platform. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.